Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us after lunch, and what a pleasure to be here. My name is Sarah, and uh, for those that don't like to wait, the punchline of my talk is how do we step into enduring and transformative relationships, not just design better services. The writer Margaret, Margaret Wheatley has said, relationships are all there is. Everything in the universe only exists because it is in relationship to everything else. Nothing exists in isolation. Let us start by acknowledging our relationship with the ground that we gather on, land that is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And we honor their past and present and future stories, and we draw humility from their resilience. I really want to underscore the we. I am one part of a team of anthropologists, social psychologists, community developers, service designers, industrial designers, graphic designers, and UX designers currently operating in Toronto, Edmonton, and Vancouver, Canada. Our most important role is to humbly listen and learn. And together, we're working in and with communities to turn our social safety nets into trampolines and move lives forward. We're co-creating and implementing social supports to enable humans to flourish. And that's with and for humans like William, James, Alexa, Haji, and the Underhill family. Over the last two years, our team has spent early mornings and late nights with more than 450 people living on the margins, left out, and too often failed by institutions and services. We've moved into social housing complexes, slept rough for days at a time in snowy embankments, inhabited bingo halls and malls, and shared beer, double-doubles, that's a Canadian thing, and home-cooked meals with people whose capacity to survive never ceases to amaze me. When I first met William, he was dragging a defunct walker across an Edmonton parking lot to the liquor store. Drinking helps him forget. An indigenous veteran and retired police officer, William was confronted with the unthinkable, shoot another human or be killed. That moment haunts him. Kicked out of veterans' housing a year ago, William is homeless for the first time in his life, lost in the shelter system, and most importantly, disconnected from his lands, his culture, and the bulls he used to ride. James sleeps on a patch of sidewalk in the poorest postal code in all of Canada, at the entrance to an employment service. Every day, the staff of this employment service step over James. They do not know his name. James really didn't want to tell me his name either. Why would it matter? He tells me he is not worth talking to. He's not worth anything. That he wishes emergency services would stop reviving him when he overdoses from fentanyl, which happened 18 times the year before. Once a PhD student in theology and the manager of a nonprofit around the corner from where he now sleeps, James cannot forgive himself for the end of his marriage. And so he sits in his own purgatory. Alexa's purgatory were mental health wards. By the time she was 18 years old, she had been involuntarily admitted to the hospital 21 times. It was only on the 18th time that a nurse stopped to give her a hug. Love and a sense of belonging is all Alexa talked about wanting. Abandoned by her mom and dad and raised by a strong indigenous grandmother until child protection services removed her, Alexa just never felt at home in her body or in the world. Until last year, when thanks to a six-month recovery program, she reconnected with her culture and rediscovered her voice. Haji longs to be reconnected with his family and culture. 
When their farm was destroyed by ISIS in rural Syria, Haji, his wife, a 106-year-old mother, and 11 kids fled. Half of his family qualified for visas to Canada. The other half remain in a Jordanian refugee camp. With little English, Haji and his family spend much of their day inside alone. Used to raucous family meals and big neighbor get-togethers, Haji finds the Canadian suburb they've ended up in safe, but so lonely and so gray. In the Underhills, they were worried about a lonely and gray life for their two sons with autism. Mom and dad stocked shelves in the grocery store and weren't sure what would happen to their boys when they turned 19 and aged out of the school system. What awaited their kids saddened them. Day programs, where they would whittle their time away in disability-only groups, hidden out of sight from community, not amounting to much. William, James, Alexa, Haji, the Underhills, all of them are full of self-effacing wisdom and insight as they grapple with some of the rawest existential realities. Trauma, grief, loss, shame, removal from family, dislocation from place, stigma, and the poverty of expectations. William, James, Alexa, Haji, and the Underhills are not personas. They're real people. Coming to know them demands more than ethnography and more than design research. Coming to know them requires deep, consensual, committed engagement, as the Canadian indigenous scholar Leanne Betasomosake Simpson reminds us. What deep, consensual, committed engagement continually reminds me is how much all of us seek acceptance, respect, and control and how acceptance, respect, and control doesn't come from a new app or a new program or a new product or a new coordinated service hub or insert the word du jour. Meaning, purpose, belonging, and love, all of the things that us humans crave, that emanates from two-way relationships, not from one-way services. Challenge is that our modern welfare state is built on a power imbalance. It's built on the one-way distribution of care. When we look at the history of the health, education, and social services, which have come to define most Western countries, we see roles, interactions, and systems designed to hold power and control, not share power and control. And these design features have become so entrenched in some of our language and daily practice that not only are they rarely contested, but they are frequently reinforced by consultants and designers alike. At the core of the welfare state is the idea of help. To help, the dictionary tells us, is to save or to rescue to give or to provide what is necessary to satisfy a need. Helping sets up a binary between the person saving, rescuing, giving, and providing, and the person in need of being saved, rescued, and provided for. And yet we know from social science literature and likely from our own personal experience that retaining a sense of agency and control is crucial for actually being helped, for moving towards change and growth. At the dawn of the industrial era, era help was mostly a voluntary act. It was provided by churches and community halls and do-gooders. But as more and more people made their way to the cities and the factory floors, new social ills arose. Sickness, unemployment, poverty. And new jobs arose, that of the professional social worker. Over the last century, social workers have been joined by housing workers, addiction specialists, child welfare officers, employment counselors, case managers, key workers, and the list goes on. The professional helper is no longer bound by moral duties and religious scripts, but by codes of conduct, 
certified trainings and accountability regimes. Their education and credentials demarcate their experience and expertise. And with that expertise comes authority. And with authority comes access to resources. For the client to gain access to these resources, they need to comply with the professional's requests. So what has come to define a client is that they have needs and they don't have the resources they need. By the 1950s, the welfare state was ballooning in size. Post-World War II, Western countries sought to restitch their social and moral fabrics, deploying health care, housing, pensions, and social services to try and do so. Their goal? Reduce harm and maximize employment. And well, the growth of the welfare state required dramatic growth of the welfare workforce. An army, really. Military principles were used to set up large command and control organizations to allocate dollars and deliver health and social services. Above the professional slotted in the manager. The frontline professional became a foot soldier, another worker bee in the hive. Just like their clients lacked authority and resources, now, too often, the worker did too, with lines of authority and budget running up, not down. By the 1980s and 90s, it was the managers in need of authority and expertise. Management consultants slotted right in, peddling processes and tools, frameworks, and PowerPoint decks. Now the managers and their workers became the clients of the management consultants, turning the beneficiaries now into what we call end users. And here enters user-centered design, with its double-diamond process and blueprints, empathy maps and keynote slides, promising to make products and services more attractive to users, not by disrupting long-standing power dynamics, but too often by playing right into them. The paying client isn't the end user, it's the manager. And the designer, like the management consultant before them, sells and retains their expertise. So, Every few decades, when you look at the history of the welfare state, we've added another layer of hierarchy to the welfare state on the hunt for the answer to rising demand and increasing costs. Management consultants know more than the managers. Managers know more than the workers. Professionals know more than the clients. And baked into each of these relationship types is the presumption that one party has a problem and the other party has a solution. But the party with the solutions isn't typically responsible for implementation and change. No, they're mostly responsible for advice and guidance. It's up to the client or the user for a successful outcome. So while the social worker might suggest a supported living program to their homeless client, the client is on the line for following through. And that's really no different to a designer suggesting a new journey map to their organizational client with that client on the line for follow-through. The Underhill family showed us what it looks like to subvert the traditional relational dynamic and follow-through. So remember, the Underhill family is the family with two boys diagnosed with autism who were frightened by what awaited their children on their 19th birthday. And so two parents with a high school education stocking shelves at a grocery store, came up with their own system workaround, rejecting professional supports and reallocating their individualized budget. So where did they go? They went to Craigslist. And what did they do? They advertised for college students studying interesting things, computer science, video gaming, animation, the students came over to do their homework and share what they were learning in class that day. And the Underhill boys shared their curiosities and would contribute to the projects. Over time, the boys discovered their own passion for programming, applied to technical college, got in, graduated, and now build websites and apps on their own. The Underhills are what we call in our work positive deviants, and their homegrown solution hints at a different way forward. What if the welfare state was organized with a different relational basis at its core? 
that of co-learner and not expert. What would characterize this relationship is vulnerability, not authority, mutuality, not one-sidedness, and an authentic commitment to shared outcomes. And this has been the central question animating our last five years of work here in Canada. Through trial and error, and believe me, lots of error, some of it quite painful, we're learning how to best capture and spread a relational basis predicated on humanism and equality. We've worked inside and outside of social services. We've focused our efforts on launching new solutions and facilitating large-scale learning and capacity-building processes. Fifth Space and Grounded Space, for example, brought more than 50 frontline and managerial staff from four large social service providers together one day a week or one week a month to research and develop more relational and humanistic practices, like turning a stayed mealtime at a group home into a dinner party with neighbors, or transforming a drop-in center in the morning with colored cups for street-involved folks to indicate their readiness to change. On the other end of the spectrum, Emotions Library and Ha huh are our two latest prototypes with North York Community House here in Toronto and Options Community Services in Vancouver, and they offer a platform for Syrian and Filipino newcomers to build new narratives about life in Canada. Huh, matches newcomers and professionals to conversations about stereotypes and cultural expectations, offering an authentic alternative to diversity training. And Emotions Library normalizes the ups and downs and everything in between with media playlists created by other newcomers. So we've experimented across different social policy issue areas, from newcomers in the disability space to the indigenous justice system. And we've also experimented with different types of collaborators, with federal and provincial government departments, to nonprofits, to cities. And where we've been most successful at bringing to life a new relational dynamic is where we've stepped into vulnerable and reciprocal relationships ourselves. Projects which started with true partnership, not with us as the de facto management consultants, designers, or social innovators, but us as co-investors and co-implementers, putting both our dollars and our time on the line, have led to far more measurable change for people. And three projects stand out. All three emanate from our deepest and hardest partnership with three disability service providers. All three are staffed by a blend of in with forward and organizational team members, and all three are actually being implemented today. All three are also what we call a forever prototype. They will always be in development alongside active delivery. Kudos, as was mentioned in the introduction, is a platform for lifelong learning, connecting adults with and without disabilities to splendid experiences in the community. Everything from stone carving to quantum physics to mochi ice cream making. Community members craft one-hour experiences based on their passions and fascinations. Adults with disabilities, who we call kudoers, log into our online catalog, book experiences for weekdays or evenings or weekends, and choose the content they want to fill their days and nights. Kadoers and hosts meet offline in the community to learn from each other. And so this is Frenet, and she's a botanist, and she's collecting plant samples in the woods with Ben, who's a kadoer. And from Ben's questions, Frenet says she saw her work in a totally different light. And from Frenet's enthusiasm, Ben gained a brand new interest in science. By brokering people to community, Kudo shifts the emphasis within the disability sector from passing time interactions to growth interactions. Aaron here was stuck in a day program, the kind of program that the Underhills feared their boys would go into and bored by the same activities on repeat. 
And through kudos, he met Kim, a local comedian, and discovered that he was really very funny and very adept at comedy writing. Kim connected him to a local comedy club where Aaron now performs. Our pre- and post-evaluation data show that learning experiences build capabilities, identity, and social networks, all of which we know from the social science literature are determining factors behind better mental health, more meaningful employment, less stigma, and greater interdependence. Now, behind kudos is a big idea, forging a different relational dynamic between community members and persons with disability. From indirect relationships based on isolation, discomfort, and fear, to personal relationships based on mutual learning. And this is Real Talk. Real Talk is a library of videos and watching parties about sex, love, dating, and relationships made by and for people with disabilities. For too long, people with disabilities have been actively denied a sexual identity. People with disabilities, their families and staff can visit the library, make and upload their own content, and come to events. And events aren't straight-up education sessions. They're two-way dialogues where nothing is off-limits for health, safety, or risk reasons. And behind Real Talk is a big idea. Shifting from protective relationships between people with disabilities and their staff and families to open relationships between people with disabilities, their staff and families, where both parties are learning how to talk and understand sexuality. And again, we know from the public health literature that the best way to keep, quote, vulnerable people safe is to squash taboos and bring tough topics to the forefront. The third prototype is Meraki. Meraki is a subscription box service bringing beauty, novelty, and choice to institutional settings like group homes. In every box are the resources and permissions to break from routine and try something new. Subscribe and choose from a season of boxes, each inspired by a local muse. Josie is an artist and interior designer, and her box on color theory introduces color in a tactile and experiential way. And each box is really designed to be a gift and an invitation to engage in community, connecting folks to new spaces, to new groups, and to new events that build on the topic and the materiality in the boxes. Also behind Meraki is a big idea. Shifting from service providers providing diversionary activities to the people with disabilities they serve to providers and persons served as co-learners and co-explorers. The box is you know, designed to be surprising and delightful for both, but mostly it's a social cue to leave the box behind and go discover new outlets in the community like the Kendama Group or the robotics meetup that neither staff nor the people they support ever knew existed. Implementing Meraki, Real Talk, and Kudos has not just been about good ideas or good process. Really, it's been about shared stewardship and structure. Kinsight Possibilities, the Burnaby Association for Community Inclusion, and In With Forward, who are behind all three prototypes, now co-own a shared space called Degrees of Change Design. And that is our co-owned space for experimentation and failure. Meraki, Real Talk, and Kudos are part of this new entity with some distinct cultural norms and expectations. We do Monday huddles where we source lateral inspiration and read social science articles. We do Friday reflections where we show and tell our work and look very critically at the gap between our ambitions and our reality using actual data. We rely on most significant change methodology to help us uh, measure and assess whether we're moving the dial on the things we care about. And in this shared space, we share staff and resources, but most importantly, a vision. 
And we also share plenty of frustration, misunderstanding, and anxiety. About pacing, in with forward likes to go fast. Tactics, in with forward is more an activist than a strategist. Style, well, our partners call us provocateurs. But along the way, we've come to appreciate that holding stress is our greatest strength. In the early days of our partnership, five years ago, whenever we encountered some chafing or conflict, one organizational partner would threaten to burn the bridge down. And we had several near-fatal collapses. And the threat of it happening next was constantly destabilizing. And so we made a pact to honor both sides of our bridge, to honor the best managerial practice of today, which the three disability agencies saw themselves representing, and to honor the next practices of tomorrow, the practices that might be more reciprocal in nature. And being able to hold the space for both has deflated some of the defensiveness and judgment that kindled our fires. We've started to learn how to not only live with, but embrace tension, compression, shear, and torsion as creative forces. Building bridges from the welfare state of the past to the welfare state of the future, from risk reduction to flourishing, from trauma, shame, dislocation, grief, loss, and stigma, to meaning, purpose, love, and belonging, requires acknowledging and understanding the competing forces at play. And rather than try and resolve those competing forces, it's all about leveraging those to do so creatively and courageously. As William told me just three weeks ago over Dairy Queen strawberry milkshakes and fries, quote, my story is quite different and it's not done. Achieving is getting back to life, not escaping it. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share our lessons learned. Thank <laughs> you.